You may be familiar with the Pulitzer Prize, one of the highest awards for achievement in American journalism. But how much do you know about the man the awards are named after? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are following Joseph Pulitzer as he made his way from humble beginnings to lavish mansions. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. Joseph Pulitzer was born in Hungary in 1847. By 1853, his family had moved to Austria where he would attend private schools. His father passed away when he was only 11 years old and his mother remarried soon after. At the young age of 17, he left home and attempted to join the armed forces, but he had poor vision and was rejected from Austria's military. During a trip to Germany, he was recruited by the Union to fight in the American Civil War, so he headed to Boston Harbor, not knowing any English. When the war ended, Joseph found himself unemployed and homeless in East St. Louis, Illinois. Without a penny to his name, he offered to shovel coal on a ferry in exchange for transportation to St. Louis, Missouri across the Mississippi River. There he found several gigs, but no real career path. He worked as a grave digger, a waiter, and tended to the animals at Jefferson Barracks. By sheer luck, he was offered a job that would change the course of his life. The Atlantic and Pacific Railroad hired him to record land rights around the state of Missouri. Joseph would travel by horseback while reading law books and mastering the English language. In 1867, he became a naturalized U.S. citizen, and in 1868, he was admitted to the bar, becoming a lawyer. While continuing to study at the Mercantile Library, he met Carl Schurz, a part owner of the Westleague Post, one of St. Louis's German newspapers. Joseph began contributing to the newspaper while covering the political events and decided to throw his hat in the ring. The 22-year-old Joseph Pulitzer was elected as the representative for the 5th District in St. Louis, Missouri. Pulitzer quickly set out to dismantle corruption in the city. He lost favor with his party after shooting an elected official in the leg, but was quickly welcomed by the other political party. During this time, he married the love of his life, Kate Davis, who was said to be fashion-forward with a desire for acquiring the finer things. Soon after, Joseph was offered part ownership of the Westleigh Post, which he could use to spread his political agenda. Then, he acquired the St. Louis Dispatch, which merged with the Post to create the Post Dispatch. But his media empire was just starting. He purchased the New York World from Jay Gould and moved to New York City, where he became a congressman in 1884. At this time, New York City and St. Louis were two of the four largest cities in the U.S., and he controlled all of their media. And with his influence came staggering wealth, which he used to build a lavish lifestyle. Though his earlier homes aren't as well documented, his first vacation house was. He purchased the estate in Bar Harbor, Maine, and hired architect Stanford White to double its size. The new house was nearly unrecognizable from the original, and was dubbed the Shatwald. The house was redesigned in an eclectic mix of Tudor Revival style and High Queen Anne style, with brick chimneys and stone towers piercing the sky. The entrance hall was finished in wood panels with ornately carved wood newel post and balustrade. Diamond-paned windows allowed natural light to illuminate the space, and pointed Gothic arches welcomed you to the second-floor landing. The entrance hall was expanded, becoming known as the Pulitzer Hall, which would mirror the staircase opposite the bulging landing and feature curtains draped in front of double-hung windows. As Joseph aged, he completely lost his vision and became increasingly sensitive to sound. He was unable to sleep in his bedroom with the sound of wind or wild animals outside his walls, so he had Stanford White design him a Tower of Silence a soundproof stone block tower where he could sleep without hearing anything other than his own breath. Pleased with his vacation house, he once again employed Stanford White in 1901 to design his Manhattan mansion at 11 East 73rd Street. It was designed in the Italian Renaissance Revival style and modeled after the Grand Palazzos of Venice with a three-story limestone block facade capped off by a stone cornice running below a limestone balustrade. As beautiful as it was, Joseph never saw this house, as he was now completely blind. But his wife, Kate, was thrilled with the beauty of the home, which contained an indoor swimming pool and an indoor squash court. Kate chose the finishes for the interior of the house, including 19-foot-tall marble columns, as seen here in front of the pipe organ. The breakfast room played on the circle, with a round table and curving furniture to fit the rounded walls set below a dome skylight, decorated with geometric fretwork. The formal dining room dwarfed the scale of the breakfast room. Pilasters were set in the corners below the ornate frieze, with painted walls spanning between them. A solid wood fireplace rose floor to ceiling, with intricate relief work carved into the panels, while exposed wood beams ran overhead. 
Even the smallest details in the house were intricately crafted by artists, as we can see one of the smaller stained glass windows depicting figures surrounding a scene from antiquity. The family would only enjoy the house for eight years, as Joseph was unable to sleep in it with all the sounds of New York City happening right outside his window. He retreated back to Shatwald, where he would live out the rest of his days in silence until his death in 1911. Following her husband's death, Kate moved to France to live out the rest of her life until her passing in 1927. With both of their parents now gone, their children scrambled to sell the mansions during the Great Depression as they became impossible to maintain. In 1930, the Pulitzer's son sold the Manhattan mansion to a developer who had intended to demolish it in favor of erecting a skyscraper. However, that plan never came to fruition and the mansion now stands, divided into 17 very sought-after cooperative apartments. In 1946, Joseph Jr. had given up hope on finding a buyer for Shatwald. The taxes and maintenance were eating away at his dwindling bank account, so he made the decision to have the mansion demolished. Though one of the mansions was lost, one has survived to be repurposed. Which one of these was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure you've hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.